everybody. This is Bonnie Vandermulen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. On behalf of our entire Wisconsin Facets staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar is entitled Able Accounts. Our presenters today are Miranda Kennedy and Jessica Wetzel. Miranda Kennedy has been with the National Disability Institute since 2006. Miranda began her career in Colorado where she worked at both the local and state level focusing on disability employment. At the national level, Miranda played a lead role with the U.S. Department of Labor's Disability Employment Initiative, increasing integrated competitive employment outcomes for people with disabilities. In 2018, Miranda came on the board as director of the NDI's ABLE National Resource Center, where she and her team of ABLE experts work with the country's most influential national disability organizations to build awareness around the ABLE accounts that can meet the needs of millions of individuals with disabilities. Jessica Wenzel is the Financial Cap Capability Director at the Office of Financial Capability, College Savings Programs for the Department, uh, Wisconsin Department of Financial Institutions. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you Miranda and Jessica. Ladies. Thank you Hello. so much, Bonnie, for having me and Jessica. Jessica, if you wanna say hi as well. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. It's really nice to be here with all of you. And we are happy to be speaking with Wisconsin Facets and sharing some information and updates that we can hate, we hope you can take and use and move forward with and share with others, hopefully, as well. Um, we really do appreciate the opportunity. I am going to go ahead and get started. You're going to be hearing from me at the beginning, and then we're going to get some updates from Jessica at the Wisconsin level, um, as well as some national level of legislation that's exciting that she's gonna be sharing as well. But I'm gonna be kicking some things off talking about the Achieving a Better Life, ex about Achieving a Better Life Experience, or ABLE is the acronym. Um, and as Bonnie mentioned, I'm with the ABLE National Resource Center. I'm gonna be talking more about what we have at ABLE National Resource Center for you and the resources and tools, uh, information you can use, but I want to start off by sharing just a little bit of background, not too much. Some of you may be familiar, others may not, but I want to talk about that ABLE legislation um, and what it means for financial independence for people with disabilities. So through the work of many different advocacy organizations, including parents over many years, um, there was awareness that was built uh, around the fact that millions of individuals with disabilities and their families receive and depend on a variety of public benefits for income, healthcare, food, and housing assistance. And it greatly impacts the finances of those families um, to be dependent on those public benefits and those resources. And many benefit programs, many federal benefits programs, require a limited income and are less than $2,000 in resources in the name of that person with a disability to be eligible for those benefit programs. This is probably not surprising to any of you, I would imagine. You probably know this. Um, we were talking just the other day. That number, 2,000, for many of those benefit programs, that hasn't changed since the 1980s, although there, of course, is work attempting to be done on that. But that's where it stands right now. And the ABLE Act, the Achieving a Better Life Experience ABLE Act, that was signed into law on December 19th, 2014, in recognition that that barrier to financial health and well being, that limit of $2,000 in resources, was keeping people in real poverty. And the ABLE Act, which was signed into law, we're coming up on six years ago creates tax-advantaged ABLE savings accounts for eligible individuals with disabilities. And we estimate that 8 million people with disabilities are eligible to utilize these ABLE accounts and be able to save more than that $2,000 resource limit. We're going to talk about what that means, and what that opportunity is uh, in the next few slides as we move forward. And I'm going to be sharing some resources with you too. Uh, so Buckle up, there's some great stuff in here for you. We're excited to be able to share. So what exactly is an ABLE account? 
So what the ABLE Act did was it allowed states to create a 529A or ABLE account. You all might be familiar with 529 college savings accounts. 529A is the next line of code in the IRS below that. Um, and it allows states to create that 529A account for ABLE eligible individuals who have a disability that began before age 26 in order to save and invest money in a tax exempt account, in order to use the funds that are in that ABLE account for qualified disability expenses, and those are very broad, I'll talk about those in a minute, as well as at the same time being able to maintain eligibility for federally funded public benefits, which is significant. And I've included here an ABLE decision guide, our very first one, it's our shortest one, helps you figure out if you are ABLE eligible. So if you have a question about whether you'd be eligible or your family member would be eligible for an ABLE account, that decision guide will help you figure that out very quickly and what you need to do to be able to show that you're ABLE eligible if you move forward. So why is there a need for an ABLE account? Well, <laughs> that ABLE account, it allows that person to save over $2,000 over that $2,000 resource limit and stay eligible for means-tested benefits. That ABLE account is in the name of the person with a disability themselves. This is an account that has their name tied to it. That's money that they have control over and that their uh, circle of support, those that they have designated can help them manage and utilize, but it is in their name, which is a game changer. Um, it's important to know that people who do not receive a public benefit may also qualify to open an ABLE account if they're eligible, if they acquired their disability before the age of 26, and that am I ABLE eligible decision guide I just showed you on the other slide right before this one would help you figure out uh, if that is the case. Many people have ABLE accounts who are not currently receiving a public benefit. There's still a real significant benefit to using that account because it is tax advantaged. Um, those ABLE account savings can be used for qualified disability expenses. They're called QDEs. We'll talk about those a bit more in a minute. They're so broad um, and they, they do seem to reach quite beyond disability specific but they are called qualified disability expenses. It is important to know that ABLE savings can be used as a supplement. It doesn't have to replace existing benefits and it, sh it shouldn't replace existing benefits, but it can supplement um, benefits such as food, housing, income or employment assistance. If, if you need to pay more than what is covered, you can use your ABLE savings account to do so. Um, I did include here on this slide, the ABLE decision guide, how to understand ABLE savings and public benefits. And that also links up to all of the federal guidance on how ABLE account savings do not impact different, you know, your HUD housing, uh, FAFSA applying for federal student aid, um, Medicaid, any number of other benefits, public benefits. We've got the resources for you in this decision guide so you can read up straight from the federal agencies who manage these programs and see for yourselves in writing that ABLE doesn't impact those benefits. And, and this guide also explains other ins and outs around that because we know that's really important for folks who are receiving public benefits to understand that ABLE savings component. You should know that in terms of state ABLE programs, you see here on the screen, um, in green are all of the states that have open ABLE accounts. The first ABLE account in the country opened in Ohio in the summer of 2016. Uh, so these are all fairly new. We've had a number of programs open end of year last year and even this year. Um, you will see that Wisconsin is in the gray currently, and Jessica's gonna talk about that in a, in a little bit. But um, there are over 45 state ABLE programs from which to choose. In fact, there are 46 states that have ABLE programs and there are 49 ABLE programs total because some states have two. Um, if you are ABLE eligible, you can open one ABLE account. Everyone who's eligible can have one. <laughs> you can have more than one. Um, but you can open an ABLE account in any state that has an ABLE program that accepts outside residents. I've got a link to our ABLE program comparison tool that's on our website at ablenrc.org. And that ABLE program comparison tool can help folks figure out, because 45 states, that's a lot of states to try to narrow down um, which program you might want to move forward with. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but I do want to make you aware that 
a lot of times folks feel like they want to wait until um, their home state has opened an ABLE account, an ABLE program. And we have heard from everyone we have spoken to who has opened an ABLE account that, gosh, I wish I hadn't waited until my home state opened a program to move forward with opening my account. You can open an account with one state and roll it over to another, either your own home state when they open one or another state. There's some flexibility there. Um, you can only do that once a year, but you're not locked in. So don't feel like you are. And that ABLE program comparison tool can really help answer some basic questions and compare multiple states and then decide which one you want to do a little bit more research on. Um, the important thing about that is this is on our website, which we, are, we do not manage any of the ABLE programs. <laughs> we just provide the information. We work with account owners and family members in developing our tools to be useful to folks. So this really should hopefully help you narrow it down, make it manageable, uh, and would encourage you to, to consider this, even though the state of Wisconsin doesn't currently have an ABLE program. So how do you open and manage an ABLE account? So most of those accounts are open online, but you can contact specific ABLE plans for alternatives if you need to have those. If you lived in the state of Maine, you could walk into a branch, but that's Maine specific. <laughs> There's a lot of diversity among these ABLE programs, and it's really meant to be you know, something that could fit anyone's need. Um, once that account is open, the account owner, that person with a disability whose name the account is in, can choose to allow others to access various levels of information about the account or take specified actions on the account. And we don't have to get into all the nuances around that because guess what I have for you right here on this slide, some ABLE decision guides. And these are kind of like choose your own adventures, right? They're really tailored to meet you know, where, what your situation is and as you move through them. Uh, the ABLE decision guides we have here are how to select and open an ABLE account. Uh, as you move through that guide, it will take you into those comparison tools, so you'll get to that ABLE program comparison tool along with some guidance on how to use that. And then once you've opened an account, how do you manage your ABLE account, either for yourself or have a family member or supporter assist you in managing that ABLE account? So those, these are two really great starter decision guides after you've figured out if you are eligible for an ABLE account or your family member is. So let's talk for a minute about those contributions into an ABLE account. An annual total of $16,000 can be contributed into the ABLE account by the person with the disability themselves and also from friends and family, a special needs or pooled trust, or a 529 college savings account rollover. That's $16,000 a year. Uh, if you put $16,000 in and you spend down, you can't add more money back in at the end of the year to get it back up to $16,000. Um, so you want to be thoughtful about how you use those funds, how you contribute those funds. You can use it as a transactional account to not bump up against that $2,000 limit. Many people do that. But for longer term goals you might have, you might want that to build. Um, and these accounts can be savings accounts as well as investment accounts. There's those options among the ABLE programs. Uh, and you can do a mix. Um, but when you are investing, there are some risks associated with that, and, and we talk about that in our decision guides and what that might mean. In addition to that $16,000 limit per year, and the limit over the lifetime is much higher for all of these programs, but in addition to that $16,000, if the ABLE account owner themselves is working, and if they're not participating in an employer-sponsored retirement plan, they can contribute from their earnings up to an additional $12,880 from their earnings within a calendar year in the continental US. Um, Alaska and Hawaii, those amounts are higher because it's more expensive to live there, but you're all in Wisconsin, so I won't tell you those numbers, but that, that's a really good resource and opportunity. I have here an ABLE decision guide on how do you find the funds to save in an ABLE account? This is something we hear all the time. Well, this is all well and good, but you know, how do I or my family member even find the funds? There's some really innovative strategies and things you may not have thought of. And that decision guide on how to find those funds to either open that ABLE account, which costs on average $25. Uh, there's a couple plans, one or two that might be zero, one or two that might be up to 50. And you get different things along those lines with that. 
uh, amount of opening the account. There's also some little nominal fees that might be associated with this opportunity. So those are things to consider and those are in the, the comparison tools. Um, but finding the funds can help you figure out how do I find the funds to open the account? How do I find the funds to contribute to the account and build and grow the account and save towards things I want to, to save towards? Um, let's talk about, in terms of those things you might want to use the account funds for, qualified disability expenses, QDEs. Um, so ABLE funds can be used to pay for items or services that relate to the beneficiary's blindness or disability that are for the benefit of that beneficiary and that relate to maintaining or improving that person's health, independence, or quality of life. This is so broad um, and it's gotten more broad. We've gotten guidance even fairly recently from the IRS that things like food can be covered. <laughs> um, there are categories uh, under which QDEs fall, um, employment, education, transportation, housing, legal or financial services, the list is long. Um, and it is important to really understand that it is meant to be broad. This is not meant to be restrictive. It's not another program that's gonna really like be restrictive on how you use those funds. Um, it doesn't have to be limited to expenses related to medical necessity um, and expenses that provide, it can benefit others um, as well. It does have to directly benefit the individual themselves. Um, we get this question all the time. I'd say nothing illegal, folks. <laughs> it has to be to the benefit of the individual, something that can be justified. But if it's helping someone achieve a better life experience, which is the name of the act, that's really what this is here for. And if you have questions, I just want to say, say it with me, because guess what? I have here at the bottom of this slide, as so many others, another ABLE decision guide that can help you determine whether something is a QDE. So that's a really straightforward guide um, if you want to dive into a bit more details than what I covered here. Uh, and that's why I've included those decision guides on each of these slides because there's more than what I can cover in a short presentation, but I want you to have those resources, those links to those guides. Um, so I'm going to share just a little bit about the ABLE National Resource Center more broadly, just stepping back and who we are in terms of being a resource to you um, and your families and your networks. So the ABLE National Resource Center, who we are, as, as Bonnie mentioned before, we're the leading comprehensive source of objective independent information about federal and state related ABLE programs and activities, including guidance on tax advantage 529 ABLE savings accounts. We have a team of subject matter experts. Um, we also work closely with ABLE account owners and family members who serve as advisors and ambassadors. And now we have social media influencers um, sharing their stories and their strategies um, with others because they're benefiting from their ABLE accounts and they want to help others benefit as well. It's really our mission at ABLE National Resource Center to educate, promote, and support the positive impact that ABLE can make on the lives of millions of Americans with disabilities and their families. We do not manage or operate any ABLE programs, so we're kind of a neutral space. Uh, for instance, people ask us all the time, which ABLE program should we open our account with? Which one's the best? Uh, for questions like that, it really depends because every person's situation is unique and there's a lot of opportunities and options out there. It's really our goal to help you figure that out for yourself and make sure you have the information, the resources, the tools to do that. Um, and if we've done that, we've done our job. And our, our website is the comprehensive source on that. So if you're checking that out, and I'll click on it in a minute here after I go through a little bit more information, uh, you'll have most of what you need. <laughs> uh, but just to tell you a little bit more about what you can find on our website before we go there, uh, and it's ablenrc.org. We have frequently asked questions. We have all those decision guides. I'll share a few others with you in a second. We have able to save podcasts with you know, experts at all levels, as well as account owners and family members you can hear from. We have ABLE webinars on demand, as well as webinars you can sign up for that are coming up. We have a bi-monthly ABLE achievable newsletter, that ABLE state comparison tool that I mentioned before, as well as we have ABLE program spotlight. You know, those 
49 ABLE programs. We, we do a good job spotlighting those. There's a number that are part of collaborations. You might have a group of 18 or a group of 12, or there's a group of five. There's many that kind of just operate their own, um, but we help you figure out and learn about those ABLE programs through our spotlights. We've got one coming up at the end of the month, uh, September 29th with the biggest collaboration of 18. Uh, another one in November. So those spotlights can really help you learn about ABLE programs. We have a number of ABLE toolkits as well. Um, we have a toolkit for service providers uh, that they can use to share information about ABLE accounts. We have an ABLE employer toolkit. Um, we developed last year with our BIPOC ambassadors, um, our ABLE BIPOC ambassadors. BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Um, an outreach toolkit uh, for communities who have members who are people of color, um, woven in stories and strategies and, and targeted efforts there. And, and we continue to build these resources all the time. Um, and these are just a few. We have other things as well. <laughs> we have stories and spotlights of those account owners and family members too. Um, this is just a quick, you know, I've been talking about decision guides throughout. And again, what those decision guides are, they're step-by-step -step guides on key ABLE topics. Uh, those account owners and family members we worked with helped us narrow down which, which are the ones that are the most useful to folks, uh, kind of beyond FAQs. And these guides are really meant to help increase your understanding of ABLE uh, and assist you in effective decision-making. We keep this information up to date because information can change. The amounts that can go into accounts or different strategies they evolve over time and we keep these up to date. So come to the website, check these out. Uh, the guides we currently have, and I was, I'm was i editing another one right now, <laughs> but the one we have, uh, I mentioned, am I ABLE eligible? How do you select and open an ABLE account? How do you understand ABLE account savings and public benefits? How do you manage an ABLE account? How do you find those funds to save in an ABLE account? Determining whether something is a qualified disability expense, as well as ABLE accounts and working people with disabilities. We're working on one right now on uh, ABLE accounts and special needs trusts. I do want to just make mention that you can have an ABLE account and a special needs trust. Earlier I mentioned special needs trusts can feed into ABLE accounts and be utilized in ways that are a little bit more flexible than special needs trusts. Um, there's certainly your folks who might benefit from just having a special needs trust, or maybe they benefit from just having an ABLE account, or certainly you can have both. We have a number of our ambassadors, our ABLE influencers who have both. Um, and it really just depends on what your, you or your family's needs are. Um, you know, some of the benefits to the ABLE account are you can have a prepaid debit card and access those funds, make decisions for yourself, learn some financial literacy. Um, and have that autonomy and agency of, of making some purchases. Um, it's also a much smaller dollar amount to open that account. Uh, it costs more to have opened a special needs trust um, and ask permission to access those funds. However, there are limits on the amount you can put in an ABLE account, like we talked about before, that $16,000 a year, and you're not gonna have those kinds of limits with a special needs trust or pooled trust. So really, you know, it's kind of, apples and oranges that combine to make a nice little fruit parfait for you. <laughs> um, so something to certainly think about. Um, they're not in competition with each other. They can definitely augment each other. And, and it really is your choice uh, which direction to go. And you can have both, like I said. Um, so that decision guide is coming. Uh, we did, just in August, which we are barely out of, uh, have our month-long education and outreach campaign called Able to Save. Uh, and here on the slide is just some great headshots. You see an array of uh, a number of our Able account owners um, who, and, and one of the family members as well, um, who has two sons who have Able accounts, um, talking about, you know, that Taylor's shared that because of my Able account, I'll have a better and more financially secure future. These folks were featured on our panels um, last month in August. And I wanted to make sure you knew um, what took place because this information is very fresh. If you didn't engage in the campaign, you can still check out the, the link to the, web, to the web page we have with the panels and the resources that went out. We also had a pretty extensive social media campaign. 
but we hosted panels with account owners and family members. We had the IRS and SSA on, as well as state able program administrators speaking and the National Association of State Treasurers who provide support to those folks and oversight to the able programs. Uh, week one was welcome to able to save month. Uh, week two is becoming an able account owner. Week three was how to help a family member become an able account owner. Week four was opening and using your account. And week five was that call to action. So you might really wanna check out that link because watching those panels and hearing folks speak to their experience, um, as well as hearing from IRS and SSA and the state able program administrators, you know, it's, uh, it's very grounding and inspiring but also it kind of lights a path and some reassurance for folks who've stepped into the space and who are benefiting and talking about how they're benefiting uh, and sharing the vision for what ABLE is about. So I'd encourage you to check that out and as well as to spread the word about um, ABLE accounts um, and you can follow us on social media and do sign up for our newsletter and check out our website. I'm gonna just take a minute to hop over to, I think I'll hop onto the campaign. Bonnie, you shared with me that I should be able to get onto this website. So if you click on that link, it brings you down here to each of the weeks. And when you drop into it, you can check out those panel discussions um, and learn more about evil accounts as well as the resources that came with each of the each of the weeks. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out. And here is just our front page. Oh, there's even a great campaign toolkit. But if you go to, this is just our front page here. This will be up for another week, uh, able to save month. But as you scroll down, you can learn more about who we are. You can stay informed. You can check out those decision guides, register for webinars, check out our webinars on demand of webinars that have already happened here's where you find those which state has the best program for you there's lots of great comparison tools here to use and check out um, you can scroll through and find some great information here on our toolbar um, and that's that is that i want to mention too oh some the resources over here on the toolbar on the top on the far right, resources will bring you to those frequently asked questions, the decision guides, webinars, podcasts, newsletters, lots of great stuff there. Something I didn't include in the slide deck, and before I hand it over to Jessica, and I look like I have enough time here, Jessica, but something I wanted to point out to all of you is here on our website, ablenrc.org, yeah, you can learn about ablenrc, but if you scroll down, you can click on this link for account owners our ABLE ambassadors, our family members who are also ABLE ambassadors. And then here's each of our years of ambassadors we've worked with, but we've kind of consolidated it here. And just because I know I'm probably speaking to mostly family members here, although I encourage you to check out all the stories, you can meet our family members and you can read up on what their stories are. Um, here you can just see their faces and a little bit of introductory information about them. At the, at the bottom, it talks about, you know, how you can read their bios. Some of them have, in addition to spotlights, I'm going to go ahead and pick on Cheryl. She's been with us since 2018. Um, she has a 20-year-old son who has an ABLE account and a 15-year-old nephew they have guardianship over who also has an ABLE account. Um, and, and both young men are on the autism spectrum. But you can see here, if you scroll down, you can learn a little bit more about Cheryl and her story, how um, her son and her nephew are utilizing their ABLE account, the work she's done with us here to get the information out about ABLE accounts. You can also, um, yeah, it's any one of these folks you can read up. A lot of them include specific strategies they've utilized um, with their ABLE accounts, it's a really nice way to learn about what can be done with ABLE accounts by finding someone who has a similar story to your own. Um, and hopefully we have that for you. I am going to go ahead at this point and stop sharing my screen and hand things back over to Bonnie and Jessica. 
I think if I click here, I've stopped sharing my screen. Let me know. And if that's this, true. Yep. This time I'm going to try and see if I can switch over to Jessica. Great. And uh, if you bear with us for a moment, Jessica, you should get queued. There you go. Okay. Now, is that showing up okay? Yep, you're fine. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, um, for joining us today. And thank you so much, Miranda, for uh, kicking it off with sort of an ABLE 101 for everybody. I highly, highly encourage um, anybody on the webinar today, whether you're a current account owner, a potential account owner, a family member of an account owner, or just an advocate in general to check out the ABLE National Resource Center website. There's truly not a piece of information that has been overlooked on that website. I refer folks there all the time. It's a great resource. I know that Miranda clicked through a lot, but um, depending on where you're at in your journey with accounts, there's truly something, something for you on there. So thank you so much, Miranda, for uh, taking us through that today. Um, as was stated, my name is Jessica Wetzel. I'm with the Wisconsin Department of Financial Institutions. I'm with um, the Office of Financial Capability. We house the 529 College Savings Program. So you may be familiar with Advest or Tomorrow Scholar. Those are our two um, college savings plans in the state. We also house the College and Career Readiness Program as well as the state's financial literacy in our schools efforts. So um, a lot here and potentially um, someday, if, if Wisconsin does uh, ever get an ABLE program, that will likely be housed in our department, too. So today I'm going to just give a quick update, um, legislative updates at both the national, so federal level, as well as just a quick update on what's going on in the state of Wisconsin as it pertains to ABLE accounts. So go ahead and advance my slide. Um, so, uh, as you may or may not have heard, um, the EARN Act, that's been in the headlines somewhat frequently lately, um, but the EARN Act actually includes a provision that relates to ABLE called the ABLE Age Adjustment Act. So, uh, the United States Congress introduced the ABLE Age Adjustment Act um, in February of 2021, and once passed, and if passed, this legislation will amend the IRS code with respect to qualified ABLE programs by increasing the age of eligibility for a beneficiary of an ABLE account from age 26 to age 46. So as Miranda covered currently, you need to um, have a uh, disability onset prior to age 26 to qualify to open an ABLE account. This act would change that to 46. Um, this is a really big deal. So if this passes, this means that um, about 6 million more individuals would become qualified to open an account, moving us from about 8 million qualified individuals to 14 million people. Um, this is a big deal for many, many reasons, but particularly this means older adults who maybe have become disabled through an accident or a chronic illness, or in particular military service as well, will now be um, eligible to open and benefit from these um, quite frankly, life-changing accounts. So this is something we're keeping um, keeping an eye on, and I would encourage you, if you hear EARN Act in the headlines, um, that's sort of your cue to, to you know, activate and maybe perhaps do some advocacy on your own. Um, there's been a little bit of movement lately. So as I mentioned, this was introduced in 2021, but in June of 2022, the Senate Finance Committee actually approved amendments to the EARN Act, which of, of course includes the ABLE Age Adjustment Act. So that's a step in the right direction. Um, and as of September of this year, so just just last week, um, there are there is some good support um, in the Senate and Congress for this. So there's 21 co-sponsors um, in the Senate and 95 co-sponsors in Congress. Um, and once I'm done sharing my slides, I'll drop into the chat um, links to those co-sponsors so you can see exactly who in the state of Wisconsin um, is supporting that. So what's next in terms of the ABLE Age Adjustment Act? Um, it has to go to the Senate floor. And unfortunately, right now, uh, we don't know when that will be. There hasn't been any buzz on this lately, unless I'm mistaken, Miranda, if you have any other idea. But um, that's really the next step uh, in getting this passed and increasing that age limit. So um, stay tuned on that. If there's any updates, I'm happy to reach out to Bonnie if I hear anything, um, and she can pass that along to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, Jessica, the only thing I would add to that is just that just like the ABLE Act legislation in 2014, and there was legislation that also passed in 2018 to build on that, there is such widespread bipartisan support, and that's really significant. Um, 
as well as the fact that potentially a million veterans could be eligible for this. Yeah, correct. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to move a little closer to home and provide sort of an update on what's going on in Wisconsin. So as you saw when Miranda shared that map of the United States, uh, Wisconsin was one of those four gray states that does not have an ABLE program. That may be not news to some of you on the call, and that may be news to some of you. Unfortunately, um, as Miranda stated, um, as it stands now, Wisconsin residents can open an ABLE account with any state that does accept out-of-state um, residents to participate in their program. And the state of Wisconsin also currently offers um, those that contribute to an ABLE account out of state the tax deduction that is associated. So if you do have an ABLE account out of state and you put into it that maximum of $16,000 per year, you can claim that on your Wisconsin state taxes, income taxes as of now. So that's one of the ways that um, we've sort of been working in the space over the past um, five or so years is offering that deduction. But um, in February of this year, Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers actually signed legislation requiring the Department of Financial Institutions to study and report on the state's options for establishing an ABLE program. So that's a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, the report was submitted on September 1st, so that's completed. Um, and it outlines sort of our three options for moving forward in this space and what a program could look like. So the first option would be following the status quo. So basically what we're doing now, which is um, somewhat passively participating in the state in the space. And um, we do offer, like I mentioned, that tax deduction. We offer information sort of on a um, as needed or as demanded basis, but we're not out there as a state proactively promoting these accounts um, because there isn't any dedicated um, office to that or position to that. Um, another option is to establish an independent ABLE plan. So that's the state of Wisconsin's independently run plan, very similar to what like a college savings program is run like. So we contract with the vendors that run these programs, program managers they're called on the back end. We provide the upfront funding and the costs associated to launch that program, develop all of the materials, the website, um, everything associated with that, employ somebody, um, all of that stuff would be option number two, so forming an independent plan. And then third is to, again, establish an ABLE program, but through an existing ABLE collaboration or consortium. Um, Miranda touched on this a very, very little bit, Essentially, there's um, consortiums of, of states that work together to sort of pool resources and allow states to achieve economy of scale a little bit more quickly when launching a program. Um, so I'll get into that um, a little bit uh, more down the road, but um, those are sort of the three options and what our report outlines um, for what, what an ABLE program could look like in the state. So just some background, um, to complete this study and make its recommendations, the Office of Financial Capability here at DFI compiled and reviewed publicly available reports and other sources of data, all of which are cited in our full report, um, should you be interested in looking at any of those. And we also conducted dozens and dozens of informational interviews with key stakeholders in this space. So that's representatives from groups like this, like Wisconsin Facets, that provide education, advocacy, or other support to individuals with disabilities, as well as their families actually talking to individuals who are interested in opening an ABLE account in Wisconsin or some that previously had an ABLE account. Um, they're a Wisconsin resident but opened with another state and either still have that account or maybe chose to close it for a number of reasons. Representatives from um, other state agencies that operate these programs so we could really get some of the nuts and bolts details that could help us make a decision on how we would launch, whether it's something like an independent plan or joining something like a consortium and then also financial advisors who provide planning in the space um, to individuals with dis disabilities and their families. Um, so I'm gonna go through basically our key findings. There's a lot more outlined in the report, which we will provide to you after today, but these are sort of the top, top findings um, that I think are, are, are important to share. Um, so first, uh, the Wisconsin uh, ABLE eligible population is just over 142,000. It's, it's likely higher now. That was the most um, hard number we could get with the data that's available. Um, so that, that's a significant amount of individuals, especially considering if we sort of pop down to that last bullet, bullet point, um, we also discovered that there's pretty low utilization of ABLE accounts by Wisconsin residents currently. I don't think that's any surprise. Um, 
we worked closely with the Department of Revenue to find out, okay, how many individuals are actually claiming a tax deduction who have these accounts? And we discovered that it was less than 300 individuals um, are actually claiming the tax, tax deduction. So there could be more than 300 um, individuals that have an account, but there are only three, less than 300 that are claiming that deduction. So either way, not good. Either way, there's a disconnect between that benefit of these accounts, um, or it's really close to around 300 people are actively utilizing these accounts in the state of Wisconsin. And that's 0.2% of our eligible population, perhaps less right now. So definitely room for improvement there that we think um, we have some answers to. Um, additionally, so we know that Wisconsin is one of uh, four states that does not have a program, but we also found in, in doing this research that um, of the four states that do not have an ABLE program, Wisconsin is the only state that um, also has not tasked a public agency or other public body with helping residents open and utilize these ABLE accounts. So, um, for example, one of the other states uses their Department of Health um, and Human Resources as sort of the go-to um, entity that's helping field questions or direct folks um, somewhere, and we do not have that in the state. So, by default, DFI has sort of taken that on, but that's certainly not something that um, is required of us. So. We're unique, unfortunately, in that um, instance too. So I did want to share um, just a couple testimonials that we included in the report that we heard from folks that we talked to. Again, I don't think these will be any surprise, but I think that it really drives the point home um, on why this report was um, requested by the governor. So People First Wisconsin shared that many people are unaware that ABLE accounts exist. For those who have heard of ABLE accounts, they may find choosing plans from many states confusing and not understand how to establish one. Adults with disabilities and parents of children with disabilities have a lot of things to coordinate, and this is another thing that involves a lot of research and work. Is it okay to establish one in another state? An ABLE account, that is. No one wants to do something wrong. That could not be more accurate. I hear it time and time again. That was one of the reasons I, I was so grateful to Miranda for joining us today was um, they do have those resources and they do walk you through, yes, it's okay, and that three-state comparison tool in terms of which, which plan should I choose is an excellent, excellent resource. Um, TMG, if, you, if anybody's familiar on the call, um, noted that many people aren't aware that they can open an account in another state, something we heard time and time again. And because Wisconsin doesn't have an ABLE program, there's an overall lack of awareness of the benefits and how to start one. Um, not only from the state level is there not proactive um, outreach done on this, but even like the service provider level, a lot of times it's deferred to referring folks to somewhere. Um, and having a, an in-state program, just there's no, there's really no um, remedy for that um, without having somebody dedicated to that. There's no point person. Which brings me to the three main recommendations that we included in our report. So first and foremost, um, the report outlines that the legislature should create the position of an ABLE officer within the Department of Financial Institutions Office of Financial Capability. So again, that's the office that I'm with. Um, why? Because there isn't one, and this position would be the individual um, dedicated to providing financial education resources for ABLE eligible individuals and their families. They'd facilitate par participation in the Wisconsin ABLE plan. They'd coordinate with public agencies like Wisconsin Facets, or if there's anybody else on the line today um, who does advocacy in this space, other nonprofit organizations serving individuals with disabilities, um, they would be their touch point. They would be their uh, person to contact should they have questions, should they need presentations, anything like that. Right now, we don't have that. Um, Recommendation two is then, of course, the legislature should authorize the Department of Financial Institutions to establish a qualified ABLE program. Um, I hope that is um, exciting to folks on here, and I also hope that isn't a surprise that we're advocating for that, um, or recommending that, I should say not advocating. Um, we're recommending that. Um, and I think for, for, for a multitude of reasons, but those testimonials that I just went through really drive home the point that Without a state-led program, um, residents are confused. They don't have a point uh, of contact. They don't have a, a, a reference to reach out to, and they know that that entity is politically responsible to them. So it just makes sense then to um, establish, at this point in time, uh, for Wisconsin to establish a program. And recommendation three, 
is the Department of Financial Institutions should establish an ABLE program through an existing ABLE collaboration. So as I mentioned at the top, when I was sort of walking through what are uh, what is this report outlining, the option kind of when it comes to launching a program was going at it completely on our own, establishing a program completely from scratch, or joining um, one of the existing um, collaborations out there. So that's sort of the route that we're recommending um, for, for several reasons. First and foremost, um, it allows it would allow us to keep uh, fees low. So there are fees associated with the account, similar to like a bank account, there's maintenance fees. Um, there's also program management fees. So those fees go, um, though nominal, um, they do go to the program manager and that's the individual, um, or, I'm sorry, that's the entity that's responsible for overseeing the actual investments. Um, by joining a, a consortium, we sort of pool resources with other states, um, and it allows us to keep fees much lower than if we went at, at it on our own and we had to cover the costs of launching, creating a website, creating all those materials, um, hiring a position, all of that stuff. So um, it also allows us to plug into a network of states and individuals that have been running these programs for around five years and sort of share information and learn from them because we will be new in this space. Um, so what's next? Um, I would encourage everybody, like I said, the full report will be sent out um, after this, or, or I think Bonnie, maybe people will reach out to you if they'd like to access the full report that'll be sent out as a PDF. It has a lot more detail, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions too, um, if we have some time, but a lot more detail on what I've outlined today. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Think if you have any questions, share that with individuals in your networks that might be interested in learning more. Um, and then, of course, the next step would be legislative action. And similar to the Able Age Adjustment Act, I unfortunately have no um, concrete details to give you on that. The legislature can essentially take this up um, whenever, whenever they see fit. So we have no, they don't share with us, you know, thank you, and they don't keep us posted on when this might happen. They might, um, or they also might come to us very quickly and, and, and have us um, sort of go through the report, defend sort of what we've put out there, answer any questions on that. Um, they also might not take our recommendation, right? They might say, no, we like your status quo. We think this is fine. We don't want to invest the money in this. Um, or they might say, we actually do want to invest the money. We want you to launch your own program brand new from scratch. We just don't know. This sort of gives our best educated recommendation on what we think makes sense for the state and what we think makes best sense for the eventual um, account owners as that program. So as it stands now, like I said, there's no timeline and when this will be visited. Um, but it's certainly something that I'm happy to keep um, Bonnie and Wisconsin facets updated on as, as as well. So, can I add too, Jessica, just something that I haven't seen that we touched on and that was missing from our presentation today is how unique Wisconsin is that you pass state level legislation to incentivize and support people opening ABLE accounts in other states. It's kind yep. of a little known. It's rare. It's not even just rare. Wisconsin is the only place that has done this that has an open and able program. So you guys are unique, but there are some incentives and supports in terms of your tax code for why you might want to open an able account in another state. And then if Wisconsin does open an able program, you certainly could leave it where it was or you could roll yep. it back over to Wisconsin. I think that those uh, incentives, they stand either way, right, Jessica? It's it's huge. So it is it is something that's unique. And if um, anybody if that's new to anybody on the call today, I would uh, take note and also share it with anybody else in your network. Um, we do we offer that large tax deduction. It's up to the maximum amount you can put into an account per year, which is right now sixteen thousand um, dollars. I don't see that, and we did not include in our report to backtrack on that. So we did not include should we launch a state a Wisconsin specific plan that you can only claim the tax deduction if you open an ABLE in Wisconsin. I don't know, that wasn't included in our report. I don't know if that's something that the legislature might come back and say we'd like to, to amend mm -hmm. that. I, I doubt it, I, I don't think so, um, but that's certainly not something we're advocating for. And as it stands today, um, as I said, there's no timeline. I would never advocate, don't wait. If this is something that's exciting and new to you, um, we know that these are life-changing. These are a big deal to be able to save beyond that $2,000 threshold for um, 
even day-to-day -day expenses to have your little emergency fund for yourself, but also big things like a house, a car, making sure you have money set aside for if you have a, um, a dog, a cat, anybody, if something goes wrong with them, I know I personally have a line item in my budget for the vet because that comes up. So it's just, I would never encourage you to wait if, if you want to, by all means, but there are plenty of plans out there. There's close to 50 plans out there that can suit your needs and as Miranda stated rolling over is always an option should you want to when and if Wisconsin does launch a plan that that will be simple to do um, and, and I'll also share on the topic of rollover um, you, can, you can also roll your 529 college savings plans into these um, accounts as well so maybe you started that for somebody in your life and you decide okay I think an ABLE account might be a better av avenue at this point you don't have to roll over the entire amount. You certainly can. You can keep some of it in that 529 college savings plan, but you can roll over some of it into ABLE. So yeah. um, lots yeah. of flexibility, but um, if this is exciting to you and you're just learning about it and you want to start saving today, don't wait. Um, we'd love to have you if we get a plan in Wisconsin. We'd love to have you as part of that, but um, uh, certainly yeah. you know, start on your journey. And it's not just Jessica and I saying this, Every ABLE account owner or family member I've met and spoken with, and certainly our 26 ambassadors that work with our center have said, gosh, you know, wish we'd opened it as soon as we learned about it, except for the few people who did open about it, open an account the minute Ohio opened their program, and they may have lived in a completely different state. So there are people who saw the benefit because mm -hmm. the use of these accounts, it's, it's really, there's a significant opportunity there. Um, and it's such a unique position in Wisconsin that you have with those incentives to apply it to an out-of-state ABLE program. Uh, other states might have incentives for in-state residents. Wisconsin, you're all unique, you know, <laughs> you have that yeah. for programs outside your state. So take advantage of that if you, if you can, if you think this is a useful tool and resource for you. Yep. Well, ladies, we do have a couple of questions and we have a few minutes to be able to tackle some of those questions. Some you've answered in part, but I'll read them from the beginning if that's okay with you. Um, one of the ones is if you reside in Wisconsin and open an ABLE account in another state, can it be deducted from your taxes? And basically, I think you just answered that particular question a minute ago, but we have some others here for you. If Wisconsin does begin an ABLE program and you already have one in another state, do you have to move it or can you keep it where it is? Nope, you can keep it where it is. If you want to, you can. If you're satisfied with your plan, um, you certainly do not have to roll it over. And I would just keep an eye on, again, we did not recommend that we retract that um, tax deduction on accounts in other states. I don't, that's as it stands now, that could change. So just keep an eye on that. Um, we'll certainly have that information. Should we um, have a program, we'll have that information readily available. Just keep an eye because if you do, if the tax deduction is an important part of this account to you, which for many people it is, and that should change, then that's maybe when I would say you might want to consider going with the Wisconsin plan, but as it stands, you do not have, nope, you can open an account anywhere. And I think you've answered this one. What is the maximum amount uh, that a Wisconsin resident can have in an ABLE account? Is it any different? Mm. Well, I can address that. It's going to be the limit of whatever state you've opened your ABLE program, your ABLE account with. So a number of states, they might tie it to like $529,000 because that's the the amount that's associated with the 529 college savings account, and it's a nice number, 529. We've seen anywhere from $235,000, 450,000, 550,000. So when you're looking at the comparison tool, you can see what the upper limits are, and guess what? If you go with a program that has a lower limit and you're really amassing a lot of funds in that account, you can roll, you can go to a different program that has a higher limit. Um, you know, one thing that, I, I do want to mention too, because that, those are big numbers, right? And, and certainly you can spin down from that amount as well. Um, save up for a big ticket item like an accessible vehicle uh, that's, that you then get funding to put a lift into or for a down payment for a home or to make a home accessible. But it can also be kind of a more transactional account where you're not worrying about bumping up against. Um, just just keep that in mind the only caveat and i didn't cover this is if someone's receiving an ssi monthly payment if you go above a hundred thousand dollars in your able account that monthly payment will go away you're still eligible and if you drop down below a hundred thousand dollars 
you will can you will get that SSI monthly payment check reinstated until you go above the hundred thousand. It's the only public benefit that's impacted. You're still eligible for it, but the payment goes away. You still keep your Medicaid, all your other public benefits, and that's going to be true for whatever those upper limits are that you can have in your ABLE account. Okay, thank you. Are there other state plans which don't charge higher fees if you don't reside in their state when you open the account? So are you charged more basically, I think, if you're not a state resident? No, it's not like going to college where you're a... <laughs> You might pay a higher rate for out-of-state tuition unless you're with like a sister state. I, I hear where you, you might be thinking that. Uh, the, and if you're looking at the comparison tools that we have, that amount to open the account, the fees, that's going to be for anyone in-state or out-of-state. I'll give you a quick tip right here. The only states that I know of that don't accept out-of-state residents are the state of New York, the state of Florida, the state of Texas, and the state of Tennessee. So those four are the only ones I know of where it's in-state only, um, and they might get some benefits from that, but any of the other programs are open nationally, and, and you're not paying a higher, a higher rate for that. You don't, the one thing you don't get, but you all don't have to worry about this because you're in Wisconsin, so it doesn't apply to you, but uh, the one thing other folks, you know, we do encourage other folks in other states, do take a look at your home state because many states, not all, have passed the kind of legislation that is passed in Wisconsin that can benefit in-state residents in terms of those tax advantages. Um, but that doesn't apply to you all. So that's just something to know about. Other people in other states have to worry about that. So, you know, that's some good news for all of you. Okay, our next and question. I'll, okay, go I'll ahead. just oh, sorry. share a little bit on that. I, I would definitely read this is. Um, I know nobody wants to do this, but there are program descriptions on each website. There are there are some states that charge higher for out of state on the account maintenance fee. So they oh. do it in one of two ways. So they'll lower it. So they'll be it'll be a going rate, or they'll lower it for um, individuals who are in their current state. Um, some charge a little bit higher on their their like asset-based fees too so i would just encourage you look at the program description we outline a little bit of that in our report and it's certainly an incentive and something to keep an eye on so um like if you ohio was the first state to launch a plan their fees are a tiny bit higher for out-of-state residents so not not hugely but certainly um something something to be aware of but that's very clearly outlined in that program description there's a little tab in each program description that says fees and it'll tell you right in there what is it for out of state and usually it's just the account maintenance fee which is a standard fee that's charged um, it's sometimes articulated as an annual fee even though it's charged quarterly so just look at that it might be a dollar fifty more quarterly um, so again not huge but certainly something that we don't want folks in our state to be paying um, if we're able to avoid that with a program eventually well, and to add to that too, there's you know a lower amount if you choose to get online, uh, yep. your statements online instead of mailed yep. to you. There's any number of, I will say that the comparison tools we have will lead you to any state program's website. And that's actually a really important point. I hope everyone pay attention to this. The reason you wanna go through our website to take a look at the state able programs and to link to that program's webpage is if you were to Google ABLE account and the name of the state, you might end up with a program that accepts residents from that state but is not located in that state. So just Googling it is actually not a very effective strategy because we have heard from folks who, gosh, I accidentally opened an ABLE account with this program that was in a different state and then I recognized, oh, it's because they take residents from my state and it was higher on the algorithm. For Google, so I wouldn't recommend Googling a specific ABLE program. Use that comparison tool and the breakdown, and it'll bring up the disclosure document too, any tax, any incentives for opening, some basic information, and then you can also find the 150, 200 page program disclosure documents if you want to really go in a specific direction and read that. It's all located there, so you can get to that information. I just want to let people know at this time that um, we have just a minute left, but we can go just a couple of more minutes if you ladies are willing to do so, because I do have a bunch of questions if you are okay with about three or four more minutes. Mm -hmm. 
I'm available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if Wisconsin does begin an ABLE program, and you are, well, this one is probably similar to the other one that you have. What is the maximum amount, um, total amount, that a Wisconsin resident can have in another state's total programs? Mm, so I just, I do want to be clear, you can only have one account. So you couldn't have an account with another state if you decide to open with the state of Wisconsin. And we don't know what that maximum account balance is yet um, we, because we don't have a program. So that hasn't been set. That'll certainly be something that's set. Um, for, I'll just give an example. Our college savings program maximum account balance right now is 527,000. So if we went in that direction somewhere upwards of that, but we don't know what that is now. But um, I want to make sure that, that that person understands you can only have one account. So um, the maximum account balance will be with whatever state. Yeah. yeah. It isn't tied to, yeah, if you're in Wisconsin, the amount that's maximum isn't going to be tied to what's in Wisconsin as a maximum. It'll be tied to whatever program you're with. If it's Wisconsin or elsewhere, that's who you're aligned with and that's what applies to you. Okay, uh, next one was, thanks for sharing such important information. Can you please share one more time the link to the training series? I believe those are some of the things that Miranda was talking about before, because the yeah. person said they didn't see it in the handout. So if you can just let them know like mm -hmm. where on your website, they might be able to find some of those. I think they're referring to um, some of those uh, webinar series that you have. Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, one of the ways that you can find it is just ablenrc.org. Uh, we actually have a whole lot under the resources on the toolbar. You're going to find the FAQs, the decision guides, the podcasts, all of our archived webinars on demand, as well as new web webinars you can register for there. I would also really encourage you all to just sign up for the bi-monthly newsletter. Our next newsletter is going to be coming out the first week of October. And you'll also be on our listserv then. So, and we don't send a, a lot out on the listserv. We send out information that would be of interest to you uh, and resources. So signing up for that listserv and the Achievable Newsletter, that'll cue you when webinars are coming, um, as well as any other news we have to share that would be of interest to you or strategies you can use. And everything I think that Miranda showed is embedded in the presentation that's that you can download in here. So those are all hyperlinked. So. Feel free to one thing I missed, Jessica, I missed something, was the links to those stories. So the stories of our account owners and family members, if you're on that website at the very top, uh, it says about, and you have to click on about, and it's the highest toolbar. Yep. Uh, and then you can scroll down and you can see account owners, family members, and that's where those stories are. And I'm sorry, everyone, I didn't get that into the presentation. Okay, <laughs> and I have actually... Two more quick questions. One is if you choose to roll your account from one state to another, um, is there a lot of paperwork involved in doing so? That's a good question. I can only, I, because we don't have an account yet, I can't speak to it. Miranda, I don't know if you have tangible experience. I just know from, this is the same thing in the college savings program space. Uh, and in that case, no. Um, it's pretty simple. It's all on. It's online. I mean, you can certainly do it via paper as well, um, most likely. But it, it's meant to be pretty slick and simple. Um, a lot of these program managers on the back end know and talk to each other, so it, it should be slick. But I don't know, Miranda, if you have any very specific, tangible experience of walking through that. Yeah, one of the things you'll find is that when you're, it's in the disclosure documents and they usually have a great table of contents and you can just go to the page so even if there's 180 page it'll pages it'll say go to page 153 and here's what you'll find in terms of how to roll over your account and the very specific details around that those disclosure documents when you actually open an account that disclosure document you will want to read um, through and be familiar with and just access as you need it it'll have everything in there and you might want to get it off directly off of their website or off of ours uh, because they do make updates to those. Um, so, and it is meant to be easy. I will say that our comparison tools, one thing we've added recently at the very top, the first thing you'll see in any of our comparison tools is the name of the program with a hyperlink to their website. We provide some more breakdown that you might want to check out that's real high level, not 180 pages, <laughs> but 
with just some top FAQs that answer questions for you. But one of the other things, in addition to the link to their website, if they have a customer service number, and sometimes you can also get that through their website, you can contact them if, if you need some additional assistance. Not all ABLE programs have actively engaged customer service. Some have more than others. Certainly if they've accumulated, you know, pooled resources together, they might have customer service at a higher level. These are the kinds of things to be thinking about. You might be paying a slightly higher fee, but you might have more support through customer service. Or you might go with a program that has a financial advisor associated with that, and that might have a higher fee. But maybe you also would have a higher benefit from that, but the cost is associated with that. So that's some of the reason why the costs might be different too, depending on the level of support that you might need, what you want to use this for. So all things to consider, but, but that information is in there. And you can also certainly contact us, info at ablenrc.org. If you have questions you're not finding answers to on our website or, or as you're doing your research, uh, we have a team of subject matter experts who, who answer a lot of questions about ABLE on regularly. They'll get back to you within two or three days. But we don't do case management, so don't ask us any case-specific <laughs> questions. But general questions we can help you with. And this is our very last question right now. Um, this person was interested in learning more about earnings while working, like the $12,880 that you mentioned and how it gets reported to the IRS. Are there specific things that you have to keep a chart of when that happens or um, you know, how do you claim that? Yeah, so the that $12,880, one thing to keep in mind, if you have, you can have a retirement account and have an ABLE account that goes up to $16,000, that's not a problem at all. You can have both of those things. If you are working and you don't have a retirement account that an employer is contributing to, you don't have that at all, and you want to save towards retirement or save above that $16,000, the $16,000 you can contribute to, or your family, friends, special needs trust, all those things I talked about, that additional 12,880, that's gotta be from your earnings as someone who is working. Um, and again, you can't have a retirement account that an employer's contributing to. Um, the, the guide that I had on there, that's what you're gonna wanna explore. It's gonna give you some more of the ins and outs around what that means, how you track that. We do always encourage folks, work with the benefits advisor um, because we want, you know, ABLE accounts, Earned income and unearned income, you know, for your eligibility for programs is still impacted. You know, your ABLE account isn't going to be to the side of that. So meet with a certified benefits advisor, benefits planner, and share, hey, I'm working. I have this ABLE account. How do I apply maybe my ticket to work with my ABLE account? Oh, and by the way, I'll put in a little plug right now. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And we will be talking a lot. We'll be having a panel, we'll be sharing resources, probably a new decision guide in addition to our existing working people, working age people and ABLE accounts. Um, so you'll be hearing from others in October as well as additional resources. So hop on and join us then too, because we'll be diving into and taking, imagine an hour of what we just talked about, but the focus is really on this question you're asking and expanding on. So hop on then with us. Well. Miranda and Jessica, thank you so very much. I don't want to take up any more of your time. We're already over time. So thank you for bearing with us and answering those extra questions that we had. We greatly appreciate it. I know that I learned a tremendous amount and I'm sure that all of those people on the um, recording with us today on our webinar really did as well. I thank you again. Thank you everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. At this time, that will end and conclude our webinar for today. Um, please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 trainings and webinars for 2022, and we are now planning our webinars for 2023. And please feel free to check out our website calendar and register for any of those upcoming trainings that you may be interested in. And also please watch for the short evaluation that will be coming your way today with a copy of our live webinar attached as an electronic copy. Again, Miranda, Jessica, thank you. Everybody have a wonderful day. Bye-bye all.